Welcome back to the fifth and final session in the webinar series on planning for community food systems, opportunity, innovation, and equity in the global south. My name is Samina Raja, and I'm a professor at the University at Buffalo, the State University of New York, where I also direct the Food Systems Planning and Healthy Communities Lab, which has been instrumental in bringing this webinar series to you. Today's webinar and the series is made possible by the generosity of our partners in Ghana, India, and Jamaica. Within these countries, food system stakeholders, civil society partners, academic partners, and local government partners gave generously of their time, intellect, and resources. Let me now begin today's webinar. Today's webinar will provide a synthesis of the past four webinars, drawing on the insights from research co-produced with our community and academic partners in Clarendon, Accra, Tiruvananthapuram, and Korda. I will also outline a framework for planning community food systems, a framework designed to address opportunity, innovation, and equity. Given the unique context of each setting, our team and partners suggest that planning for community food systems must emphasize a process rather than a prescription for planning. I will detail this process today. Finally, planning for community food systems can be only as good at it as its implementation. In the concluding section of the webinar, I will share multiple implementation tools that communities, especially local governments, can consider in their efforts to support community-led food systems. Let me begin first with a recap of the reach of this particular project. The ideas in this webinar are drawn from four sites one in Jamaica, one in Ghana, and two in India. All sites share some contemporary challenges. Each site has unique opportunities, and curiously, all four are post-colonial settings impacted by histories of economic exploitation and forced migration, including through slave trade and indentured servitude. An anecdote of shared history is well illustrated by none other than Aki, the fruit from Clarendon in Jamaica, shown on the bottom right of your slide, a fruit which traveled continents from West Africa, possibly Ghana, to Jamaica and is now the national fruit of Jamaica. Along with sharing a post-colonial legacy impacting their communities' food systems, the four sites are also coping with 21st century challenges of urbanization and climate change, though to varied degrees. The four sites also vary in population size and levels of urbanization. Clarendon at the bottom of the table is the smallest, while Tiruvananthapuram at the top is the largest. Therefore, each place will likely need varied strategies in planning and rebuilding their local food systems. In all four sites, as you heard from prior speakers, community food systems are a key infrastructure. In addition to being a source of nutritious food, the food system is also an economic driver. However, to understand the economic power of the food system, it is necessary to not conflate the terms agriculture and food system. Agriculture, or for that matter of fact, any other means of food production, is an integral but partial component of a food system. Collectively, though, the food system can enhance the nutritional, economic, and ecological well-being of a place and its inhabitant. At the moment, however, although each sector of the food system is receiving considerable attention in the four sites, a systemic view is rare. Along with being invisible as a system, communities' food systems face a number of challenges, especially when viewed through the lens of a smallholder farm household. Producers have limited resources, market reach, and physical infrastructure. You heard about this in the case of Clarendon, Jamaica. 
Availability of aggregation, wholesale, and processing sectors do not match the scale of food production sector in many of these communities. Every sector across the four sites is negatively impacted by climate change, urbanization, and globalizing food systems. And these negative impacts, in turn, weaken connections across the food system sectors. Last but not the least, consumers are experiencing malnutrition from both under and overnourishment. Nonetheless, in all four sites, a number of opportunities were shared, by, sh shared with you by our speakers in webinars two, three, and four. All sites have a deep and rich history of community-led efforts to strengthen food systems. Tunnel in Kerala, Sangmaitri in Kerala, Living Farms in Odisha, and a number of initiatives in Clarendon and Accra. In all sites, micro-innovations as well as adaptation to challenges are evident. Finally, in all sites, there are policy advocates and champions pushing for broader structural reform. In Kerala, for example, the local district government is spearheading an effort that addresses both climate change and food systems. Given these opportunities and challenges in communities, what characteristics might be of value in planning or when planning for a more sustainable and healthy community food system? This is a question we attempted to answer by distilling the experiences of our four communities and grounding these experiences in the existing literature on food systems planning. The characteristics of good food systems planning, as you will note in my comments, are designed to build on local opportunities and assets, ensure innovation, and aim for equity and fairness in a planning process. Three levers of importance to our food system stakeholders. The Opportunity Innovation Equity Framework suggests that any initiative to plan for good food systems must have at least 10 characteristics displayed on the right side of your slide. Planning must build on prior opportunities and assets in communities. Planning must ensure inclusion. It should be forward-looking. It must ensure the welfare of present and future generations. It must also amplify, not dampen, innovation. It must be based on evidence from the community. It must be spatial because community food systems are inherently spatial, linking more urban communities with rural areas. Planning must demonstrate a systemic, not sectoral view. Planning must protect the public interest. Planning must be linked to action and finally, planning activities must be held accountable through monitoring. We next outline a process that may help communities and their constituent local governments to engage in such a planning effort to strengthen food systems. I will begin by acknowledging that urban, regional, and rural planning prescriptions across the global north and the global south have had their share of failures. Urban renewal efforts in the United States, for example, have decimated entire neighborhoods. Thus, we argue that efforts to plan for and strengthen communities' food systems must privilege good planning process over an ideal planning prescription. As illustrated in the diagram, such a process is not linear. It also involves multiple stakeholders, something we highlight in subsequent slides. Effective planning processes require a commitment to inclusive relationships and governance structures. In many communities, these governance structures take the form of a community advisory group or a food policy council. The picture on your right is an example of a food policy council or an advisory group of food system stakeholders that is charged to advise the local government in Buffalo, New York on food policy. The council includes a variety of stakeholders, including urban farmers, youth, and local government representatives. A scoping process can vary greatly. 
Food systems plans can be prepared at a neighborhood scale or for larger scales that encompass urban and rural areas within a single region. In Jamaica, for example, a food system plan could be prepared for an entire parish, shown in green on your right, or for a smaller area, shown in the blue box, for example. During a scoping process, a community can determine the appropriate geography for the planning process, the time horizon for the plan, and the budget. Once a scope has been established, the community at large can be invited to join the food systems planning process. It is important to ensure that women and smallholder farmers are at the table. Community advisory groups shepherd the process. Individuals can enter and exit the planning process at any point. A key component of the planning process is to facilitate a community-wide conversation on what a future community food system might look like. This aspirational vision may be developed in conjunction with existing community events, including festivals and culturally relevant occasions. A community may envision its future food system to be one that is agroecological. It may imagine its food system to be localized and so forth. The key is that the vision is generated by the community itself. Planning for the future of a community food system requires an assessment of current conditions. Such assessments can rely on quantitative, spatial, or qualitative methods for gathering information. On the right-hand side is an example of a map that assesses the proportion of households that are not within walking distance of a supermarket, nor do they have access to an automobile. In essence, these households have limited access physical access to food. Irrespective of the assessment methods used, results from assessments help identify assets, challenges, and opportunities in a community's food system. Then, community members and planners working on their behalf identify actionable ideas for implementation. Ideas or recommendations are accompanied by clear and measurable indicators and benchmarks. This phase may also result in a written document or a food systems plan. An example from the Buffalo Niagara region called the Growing Together Report is illustrated on the right. When appropriate, a local government or a similar entity may adopt or endorse a food systems plan. A plan is, of course, only as good as its implementation. Implementation is more likely to occur if those leading the planning process genuinely involve a diverse set of stakeholders in step one through seven. Implementation tools and tactics vary widely and will depend on the context of each community. In a few slides, I will go over some sample implementation tools. Finally, no planning process is perfect. Therefore, it is important to ensure that the planning process includes time, and resources for monitoring the successes and failures of the planning process as well as the resulting plan. Monitoring and evaluation processes should include clear and measurable indicators. Indicators should also be relevant to their community members. Next, I will dive into some implementation examples for strengthening food systems through local government action. Though the powers of governments vary greatly, country by country, local governments can impact the function of food systems using a variety of implementation tools. For the sake of clarity, we categorize these tools into five groups. New forms of governance, public finance action, construction of physical infrastructure, adoption or modification of laws and regulations, and finally, creation or modification of public programs. New governance arrangements may include, as noted earlier, the establishment of coalitions such as food policy councils. Perhaps the most underappreciated area has to do with the manner in which local governments raise, defer, or expend revenues tied to all food system sectors. For example, some local governments may reduce licensing fees for vendors that sell healthy, locally grown produce. This policy implementation tool would encourage local vendors. 
Local governments also routinely expend funds for physical infrastructure, such as roads, buses, shelters, markets, etc. They also control physical assets that are crucial for farming, such as land and water. Strategic deployment of these assets can strengthen food systems. Improved bus networks can increase access to food retail. Access to land can improve urban agriculture. Some local governments, such as in Mexico City, operate a community dining facility. In Quito, Ecuador, and a host of other cities, public land is provided for urban agriculture. Where allowed by legislative authority, some local governments also adopt bylaws to strengthen local food systems, such as bylaws that support urban agriculture and street vending. Finally, in many cases, local governments also operate programs that strengthen each sector of the food system. For example, a number of local governments around the world support programs that encourage backyard gardening and backyard composting. In summary, local governments have at their disposal a toolkit which can be deployed creatively and collectively to strengthen community food systems. Because our time is short, I would like to point you to two freely available and searchable online databases that contain examples of plans and implementation tools to strengthen food system. These are actual implementation tools. One is a database focused on global examples, while the other is focused on examples from the United States. Both are available through websites maintained by the UB Food Lab. This brings me toward the end of my presentation. Throughout this webinar series, our speakers have pointed to the many opportunities and challenges that food systems offer communities. Yet community food systems remain threatened by rapid urbanization, climate change, and globalizing food supply chains. Local governments and planners can play an important role in planning for equitable and resilient food systems. Local governments must do this work in partnership with civil society organizations that are already leading the way in rebuilding food systems. And in these partnerships, it is especially important to include marginalized individuals, such as women, whose uncompensated labor keeps the food system intact in many, many communities. Thank you for listening. This concludes our fifth and last webinar in the series on planning for community food systems in the Global South.